Uh, you've got a homework assignment. It's due on Tuesday. I think some of you have probably already finished it. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is more um, the softer side of Excel. You know, rather than calculations and formulas, it's more about appearance and formatting. <laughs> so it's Excel fashion, in other words. So uh, it's, uh, it's still every bit as important, though, because if you have calculations that can't be understood, then um, your, uh, your communications can fail just as easily as if the calculations themselves are wrong. So let's talk about that. You know, till now we've done charts statistics, curve fitting, calculations, um, but spreadsheets also need to be user friendly. And the reason for that is for every hour that you do calculations as an engineer, you'll probably spend 10 hours doing communications. And this is something that a lot of students don't understand while they're in school because, you know, we instructors spend so much time teaching you how to do calculations that you don't end up appreciating um, what the nature of the job is after you graduate. But in most cases, regardless of whether you're working for a government agency or a design firm, you're going to be working on projects and a really important part of the project is explaining to people the idea behind your thinking. You know, sort of communicating the rationale or helping people understand what the calculations were so that they can be replicated or so that some years down the line you can remember uh, what you were thinking when you set things up a certain way. So you think about how hard it is. By the way, if, you're, uh, if you haven't already, would you switch off your screen? I hear lots of mouse clicking. And when there's mouse clicking, I don't think fingers and ears can work at the same time. Because if you're clicking, that means your focus is elsewhere rather than what I'm saying. And I want you to focus on what I'm saying because it'll be on the exam. All right. So uh, my point is that um, think about how easy it is to forget something that you learned in January by the time final exams come around in May. I mean, it seems like a lifetime ago. When May comes, the stuff you learned in January, it might as well have been when you were three years old that you were learning that because it just seems so distant. Well, now consider, rather than just a couple of months, consider coming back to a project several years later. And it's a very detailed calculation somewhere in a spreadsheet, and you don't really remember what you were thinking or why you did it a certain way, you may have to just throw it out and do your calculations over from the beginning. But if you take the time to form out a spreadsheet in a really clear way, you can, number one, save yourself the trouble of having to do the calculations over and over again. Uh, but you can also reuse a spreadsheet on a different project. Or you can share a spreadsheet with a colleague of yours, someone else who's working on the project, and they can pick up on what you're trying to communicate really easily. So um, Excel is a way of communicating engineering ideas. The spreadsheets are, are a really important and increasingly relied on tool for doing that. And so we're going to be talking about how to format cells, create tables with um, uh, centering, using different colors to make it easier to visualize rows. We're going to be looking at some uh, different viewing options. So just as an illustration of how different formatting can make things seem, consider these two numbers here. 2.4, which is just in plain, normal, uh, I think this is Calibri text, or $2.40. And I don't even know what font that is, but um, they appear to be different even though it's the same underlying data. And so we can make small adjustments to Excel can have a big effect on how things appear. Um, one of the ways that you've probably already used for doing that is here in the, uh, the font size, font style area. You can uh, fill in different colors to emphasize cells that need to be changed, and you can change the color of text itself. So with the file that you've already downloaded, let's play around with that toolbar. So go ahead and turn your screen back on. And with this, you'll notice that the default font style and size is Calibri 11. Um, now, we may want to emphasize certain columns or certain rows. And so in order to do that, let's highlight the headings at the top. and. Um, 
We'll start off by changing the, uh, the font to make it bold. So that's obviously just the B here makes it bold. And then you could, if you like, also change the color. So with a drop-down box here, there are a, a series of standard colors. And if you want a lighter shade that's available, for example, if I selected red, but then I go back in here, you can do more colors. And then with this slider bar, change the tint, like the intensity of red that you want to have for the, uh, for the text. Now, if you're printing in black and white, it won't make, make much difference. But if you are uh, creating a PDF that's going to be displayed online, then you may uh, get some value out of changing font colors to represent different things. And so if I was to change this to green, and then you can fill in the color behind the cell to highlight some important information. So we've done conditional formatting, which is highlighting it in an automatic way. These can be used in kind of a manual sense as well. Now, in the same toolbar area is a way to put in borders. And uh, so if you highlight all of the data that we've got and just do the default button, what you'll notice is it only put in the, uh, the line at the bottom. It didn't do all of them. And so if you highlight again and you want all of them to, be, uh, to have the border, you have to go in the drop-down box here and do all borders. And so now if you've done all borders, then there are the borders. And you know, when you're looking at Excel, let me undo that just to make a point. Already, Excel is showing you these faint gray lines to help keep the data separated. But if you print, those little faint gray lines aren't going to be there. Let me show you in a print preview how things appear differently on the paper than they do on the screen. So let's say, for instance, if I was going to make a PDF or print it to paper, those, um, those faint gray lines that were helping to keep things separated aren't there. But if I use this border, you know, if I highlight all of my data and do the all borders and then print, you'll notice that now the lines are there. And so it helps you to keep the, uh, the columns and rows separate. Okay. Any questions about how to use these tools? All right. Um, the next thing that we'll take a look at is uh, the format painter. And uh, instead of copying and pasting the contents of a cell, the way the format painter works is if you have a, a certain um, formatting that you want to paste into other areas, then you can use the format painter to do that. So let's say that here I take these and I want it to be bold, italic, and have it be orange text. So I can copy those cells here. And then here, I'm going to do the Format Painter. And you can highlight the areas that you want as the, uh, as the target and the destination. So let me start over. All right. So these are the ones I have bold, center, and maybe in orange. Turn on the Format Painter, and you choose the ones that are the origin. Oh, geez, I keep screwing it up. All right. You can tell I don't use the Format Painter very often. All right. Let me try this one more time. All right. There it is. All right. So it's not pasting the, uh, the numbers, but what it's pasting is it's pasting the formatting. So these numbers are staying the same as they always were. But what I'm able to sort of be wiping any place I put the, uh, the format painter is whatever formatting I had in the original location. All right. Um, we have a lot of control over things like the font and the font size. And the thing that you'll use a lot is the superscript and subscript, because in engineering, like in units, for example, we'll have cubic meters per second. And if you just tried to, uh, let me put this back to normal. 
All right. Um, let's say that we wanted to say that this is uh, flow data in cubic meters per second. Well, right now it just appears as M3 per S. And if I wanted to have that actually be a superscript for the number 3, the way I can get to it is I can highlight the number, right click, and then format the cells. And this is that dialog box that it was showing on the other screen. And we'd want it to be a superscript font. And so now once you indicate superscript, then now the 3 is up above the M. And so in subscript, sometimes in chemical formulas, you may use subscripts, for example, like H2O. So if you wanted the 2 to be down below the H, then you'd highlight it, right click, format cells, and subscript. And so that's how you can get the text to be either above or below where it ordinarily would be placed. So the other place, the other way, rather than the right clicking, if you click on this, it brings up the format cells. So if I wanted to take that H2O and just put it back to a normal 2, I can highlight it, and then, uh, I guess not. It pops this out only before. Turn off the superscript, and there it goes. All right. So here, since, since I have some specially formatted cells, uh, some specially formatted text in this cell, when I bring up the font settings dialog, you'll notice this superscript is active. And so if I turn it off, then the superscripts that I had before will go away. OK, so that's how you can get at some of the uh, formatting tools. Of course, there's also the same sizing and font options that you could get elsewhere. You know, we already have access to the changing the font type, changing the font size. So if we wanted something to be larger for emphasis, then all we would need to do is just highlight the cell that contains the text and then change the size to whatever we like. We could bold it and so on. Now, one thing I'll point out is that right now, this is left justified. Um, so that means it's aligned to the left of the cell. If I wanted it to be centered, and so like right now, all of these are to the right of the cell. If I want them to be centered, I could highlight all of these columns and click here. And now it's going to center all of the data. And it centered the text as well. Sometimes, depending on where you have the, uh, the descriptions, you may want the, uh, the text. Sometimes you may want it justified like this so that you're going to be putting the numbers next to it. So it would make it really obvious that these two, these two information things go together. But like if I had it centered, then part of that's going to go away. You see how it's just saying text in format, and then it's hidden? Because there's information in the cell that's next to it. So sometimes you have to use the alignment to kind of control how things appear on the page. If it was just the normal alignment on the left, then you don't see all of the cell. Now, of course, I could make this cell larger, but now the columns are kind of missized, where one of these columns is much wider than the rest. And so sometimes the easier thing to do is just to justify the, uh, the text so that it spreads towards the left instead of towards the right. There are also options for aligning text. Uh, we won't take the time to look at that, but you can uh, indicate the angle that the text is displayed at. What I will show you how to do, though, is wrap text and merge and center, because it's important. Um, so just to give you an idea of what the merge and center does, if you're going to say, uh, this is the title of my data table. now. If I want this to be all the way spread across all of this data, one way to do it would just be to like copy and try and paste it so that it's centered and manually 
like put it in the right spot. But what another option is, is I can highlight all of these cells together and then do this merge and center. And then it creates just a single cell, the entire width of the table. And so now um, the, the, the title of the table is spread across all of the columns that are relevant. So that's nice about merge and center. Now wrapping text is nice when you have a really lengthy title that otherwise you don't want to adjust the columns for. Um, so just as, a, as an indication, like maybe these numbers represent different locations. And if I wanted to put the name of the location, maybe this is um, Howell's, uh, let me change the size of this because that's kind of large right now. I'm going to change this text back down to 11. All right. All right, so you see how the text is kind of, uh, it's running into each other, so I wouldn't be able to display it all. So my options are either make it wider, which you don't want to have, since there's so many columns, if you made each title really wide, then that's going to make the spreadsheet itself too wide. So one way of getting around that is to, um, to wrap the text. So highlight these two columns and push the wrap text button. And what it does is it'll sort of jam things down and fit it into the existing width. And so the nice thing about that is that we have plenty of vertical space to play with, but we were constrained width-wise because there are so many uh, columns. And so the wrap text will allow you to make titles go uh, vertically rather than horizontally. And if I made this even narrower, for example, then it'll just sort of keep adjusting things as well as it can so that I can adjust the columns to make them more narrow. So that's wrap text and merge and center. Any questions about these formatting tools so far? Merge and center. All right, we already did that. All right, now we've uh, played around with some of the number formatting options previously because remember um, we had one example where the graph was showing too many zero digits on the right-hand axis. Now right now this is formatted as general, but if I highlighted some of these numbers and I switched it over to number, now it's going to be showing these decimals. And you can control the number of decimal places that are shown by the increase decimal or decrease decimal. And the general rule is uh, to show as few as possible that you still are able to detect the trends in the data that you need to see. Because if you had this entire spreadsheet with lots of extra data points shown, it just makes it more visually busy. I mean, you're not understanding more about the data um, by having all those extra zeros there. It just becomes kind of a visual mess as compared to if I now decrease the decimal so that it's only showing the whole numbers themselves. So it kind of makes it a little bit more clean if you don't show excessive digits. Time we've talked about before in the, uh, in the videos. We talked about how time is formatted, so that's extraneous. Um, all right, there's a way to double click columns to make the uh, widths just barely big enough to hold the data. So I'm going to delete these titles that I had before. You'll notice right now that the columns are wider than they need to be. We could have made it narrower, and so you could do that manually. You can click and drag that and make it narrower to try and fit all of the data onto a single page. So that's one manual way. And when I'm doing that, look at up at the top what it's saying. It's saying width 7.64, 91 pixels. 7.09, 85 pixels. And so clicking and dragging can sometimes be a little bit imprecise. If you want to specify exactly how wide it should be, you can right click on it and bring up this column width dialog here. And so maybe I want to see what a width of 5 looks like. All right, and so now it's 5. Column width, 
five. And you can highlight multiple columns at a single time and apply that column width operation to more than one column at a single time. But there's even a, uh, a better way of doing it, and that is if I double click, then it'll make it just barely large enough to hold all of the data that's there. So if you double click, it's going to compress all of the data down into enough rows. And I can highlight multiple cells and double click. And now all of my table has collapsed down just into the minimum width needed for all of the data. So that can be handy for getting things onto a single page. Everybody get that double click up at the top? And of course, the same thing is, uh, is true with the uh, row heights. You can manually specify the row heights, or you can click and drag them. So let's say, if I was going to print this, I'm going to do a print preview. Here's what it would look like on a page. I've got a lot of dead space down here. It would be easier to read this if I printed it out by making the rows higher, like making them take up more of this dead space down below. So the way I could do that is I could highlight each of these rows, and let's right click row height. Instead of 14.5, if I made it 25, now let's take a look at what it would appear to be if I printed it. So it's less crammed. You know, it's using up some of that space before that was wasted. What other suggestions would you have to make this a nicer looking print? Any ideas on what else we can do to make the data more visually appear, uh, uh, pleasing? Centering it, absolutely. So let's try that. Right now it is uh, it's at the bottom of the line. It's at the bottom of the cell, near the line. So highlight all of the rows. With the shift button, you can do all of them. And then here is the vertical alignment. We want it in the middle. Now it's in the middle of the cell. And uh, another thing is we have this whole dead row A. So we could delete that. All right, now let's do a file, print preview. So now it's, uh, it's centered. That looks better. We could even make the rows a little bit taller than, what is it right now, maybe 25 or so. We could make it taller than it is. And, um, yes? I'm sorry, I just Good question, yeah. So highlight all of the data that you want to apply the operation to, and then it's just this button here, middle align. What it controls is the vertical alignment on these buttons, and then it controls the side-to-side uh, -side alignment with these buttons. So if I clicked on this top one, then they're going to go to the top of the cells, the bottom, and the middle. And likewise here, it'll move the data to the left, to the center, or to the right. All right. Um, I'm going to close this without saving it because I want to open it up fresh again, just the way it was when I originally downloaded it. Let's see if I can find where that went. I'll have to download it again. That's fine, though. All right, so here was the original data set without any formatting or adding that stuff. Now. If I do this file print preview here, look right now, it's splitting it over three pages. One, two, three. So if this got printed out, let's say you're doing a lab report and you want to give your data to the professor, it's going to be really useless to print this out across, broken across three pages because imagine you've got just two columns of random data here without knowing what each row corresponds to. You know, this might be site number. And so, you know, this 304, what site number did that go along with? You know, you'd have to get a rule, you'd have to rip off all three pages, put them together, get a ruler, and try and figure out 
you know, um, which site number went along with what data reading. So there's, there's a single button that'll solve that problem. Down here, when you're doing the print where it says no scaling, if you click the uh, fit sheet on one page, it forces the entire chart to be on a single page. Now what do you notice? It's going to be pretty small, but it's still going to look better than if it's broken across three pages. And we could fix things even, even better by switching from a portrait orientation to a landscape orientation. And so now it's, it rotates the page and the text is going to be a little bit bigger than it was before. So, you know, the easy things to do to make this data a little bit more viewable would be to throw in some borders and then change the widths because now it's maybe unnecessarily wide. We don't want to collapse it down all the way. That's kind of cramped. So I'm going to undo that and maybe I just make the uh, column widths five. All right, center it. And now if we were doing a, a print preview, then that's a lot easier to read than anything that we'd seen previously. We could make the rows taller to use up some of that dead space. So right click, row height, and change that maybe to 25. Vertical justify it to the center. And if you look at how that's going to print out onto a single page again, we're doing the fit sheet on a single page, that's actually going to turn into a pretty easy to read data table compared to how it was just you know, one minute ago. And if we switch that back off to no scaling, then we have the problem again if it's broken, in this case across four pages, which would be utterly useless because if these are our, um, our column titles and these are the row titles, okay, so this data doesn't have the column titles, this data doesn't have the row titles, and then this remaining leftover has neither. And so tables like this drive me nuts. <laughs> So just a one button, fit sheet on one page, solves the issue entirely. All right, let's see what else we got here. Uh, sorting. This data is already sorted by the, uh, the left column. Um, this isn't the best data set for sorting to demonstrate. I'm going to hold off on showing you how to do sorting uh, till another class. I'll get a, an example file with some names on it so we can show how to sort by name. Um, there is a way to change the way that uh, Excel like, uh, shows the data on the, on the sheet right now. And if you go to the View tab, uh, you'll notice that right now it's showing it as normal. You can do a page layout that shows what it's going to look like if it's printed based on, the current, um, based on the current setup. And so if you had a header that you'd created previously, then it would, it would appear on this page layout. Uh, I almost always leave it in the normal view. And then if you want to know what it's going to look like when it's printed, you can do just the, uh, the print preview look. But that is you can actually do the work in the page layout view if you prefer to see things that way. Um, all right, so we've seen those views there. And um, you had a previous in-class exercise where you were creating the headers and the footers, you know, when you were calculating the uh, the weight of a slab based on the area and the thickness. And so that would have been another way to actually see how those footers were appearing was to switch it over to the uh, page layout view rather than viewing it in the normal appearance. Um, freezing panes is kind of interesting so that you can uh, see columns that have the, uh, let me go back to normal. You can continue to see like the column titles. Let me just illustrate. These are, you know, one, two, three, four. That's important. And if, but if I scroll down, I don't get to see it anymore. So I have to keep going up and down to see which uh, column title corresponds to which data site. 
And if you freeze the panes, that's a way of showing always the top row. So see how it's staying right here on four? If I scroll down, it's always going to leave that on four. So if I undo that freeze pane, let's go up to, uh, okay, freeze pane, unfreeze it. Okay, so this, the one that's shown right now on the top, all right, if I freeze at this point, then as I scroll down, it's always going to keep these data points shown. So that it's easier for me to know which column number each one of these goes with as compared to before when it wasn't frozen. All right. So you have options here just to do the top row, the first column. So if you're doing the first column, then as I scroll side to side, it's always going to show A, which is great, assuming that the, uh, the, the column information you have is over in A. Now it is. So I could scroll sideways and still see which row number the data corresponds to. That's what freezing is all about. Something that's related to that is splitting. In splitting, it's kind of like you have a couple of different windows at once. Um, in splitting, I could scroll up to the top with this part of the window and down here. And so it's similar to freezing because I can still see the data from the top row even as I'm scrolling down through a really lengthy data set. All right, so I've showed you about how to switch the uh, from portrait to landscape. Uh, let's talk about changing the, uh, the print margins and how to define what's actually supposed to be printed. All right, so uh, I'm going to turn off the splits. And um, if I highlight just a portion of this table, one of the print options that's available, if I go to File Print, the default that you'll notice is it's going to print the active sheet, meaning that I was over here in sheet one. Even if we have extra sheets, if I went to print now, it would just print whatever this active sheet is. So right now I'm on sheet three, so if I do file, print, it's going to show a blank spreadsheet because there's nothing there. But if I go back over here to sheet one where there is data, the print option right now is for the active sheet. But on this active sheet, I have just a few of the cells highlighted right now. And so if I do file, print, and selection, then it's only going to print those cells that I had selected. So I can have a really lengthy data set. And if I wanted to focus in on a certain part of that, I could just highlight the ones that were of the most interest to me. So this is here where you can choose whether you want to have the entire workbook, meaning multiple sheets one active sheet or even a subset of the active sheet, which is the selection that you have indicated. Now, here is where you can access the, uh, the margins, which is how much white space to have around the page. And if, if you want to try and maximize how much is printed, you can switch to narrow. And when I click on narrow, it's going to move everything over to the left and up because it's going to have less space at the top and less space on the left. But you can put in custom margins, and here you can see the guides that it's giving you of how big you want the space to be all around the page that isn't having text in it. So by adjusting the margins, I can sort of force the data table into the center of the page if that's what I want to do. And the, the, the times that this would be important is if you're going to be like putting a spiral binding on something. Let's say now I've got it in portrait. If I was going to be doing a spiral binding, uh, I wouldn't want the data really far over to the left. Or if you're going to be doing a three-hole punch. So if the uh, margins were in the narrow range, it might be that some of the punches are actually going to punch through the text if it's too far to the left. And so that's one of the situations where you have to be kind of a little bit careful about which margins you use. Is You want to give enough 
margins on the side that you're going to be binding the pages together so that the uh, text itself isn't getting punched out. <coughs> Any questions about formatting? Okay, today's a quick one. Let's take one final look at the announcements and I'll turn you loose. The uh, homework assignment number six, that's due on Tuesday, and I'll, I'm happy to stay around and answer any questions that you might have if you want to work on that or if you had any problems as you've been uh, working on it so far. <clears throat> uh, other than that, I will see you next time. Have a good day. Oh, yeah, great question. Thanks for reminding that, remembering that. Um, you know, there is something I want to show you that you may need to know for the homework. All right, so if then. Um, yeah, I'm glad you remembered that. Uh, what problem does that come up on? Uh, it's for the second homework question. Mm -hmm. Let's pull up the homework. So, yeah. Yeah, this is a tip that may help you on the assignment. So let's go to uh, homework assignment. All right, so on the assignment, you're supposed to be identifying how many of the tricks, uh, trucks are over the limit, right? So there's 80,000 pounds is the legal limit for those trucks. Let me download the, uh, the data for that. I think that was just on the main page, right? This one. Oh, this is where it's going to just display it. Save link as, and it'll let me get the text file. No, wrong one. that thing. Oops. Well, I'm just going to open it. All right, so here's the data. And um, you have to identify like how many of them are overweight. And so let me show you how to set up an if-then statement that may be useful to you. 80,000, 80 is the limit. And so there, there's like thousands and thousands of data points here. And to go through it manually, I mean, you could set up a conditional format and then count, but that would be really tedious. You'd probably go crazy before you got halfway through the list. So instead of doing that, check out an if-then statement. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it to return the number 1 anytime it's overweight. So equals if, if this number is greater than 80, then I want it to return the number 1. And if it's not true that it's over 80, then I want it to return the number 0. All right. So you'll see here it returned the number 0 because 36 is less than 80. But where, where have we got one that we know it should be returning the number one? If we go down a little bit, where is our first overweight truck? Here's one. So if I double click to apply that same formula all the way down through all of the cells, so all 40,000 of them, it's done that analysis. So down here on this one, 80.6, and it's giving me a one. So why do you think it would be useful to have zero for no and one for yes? Any guesses on what direction this is headed in? You sum them. Exactly. Yeah. So if I do equals sum, and then remember what was the uh, keyboard shortcut to get all the way down to the bottom of the list from last time? Exactly. Control, shift, down arrow. And so what that's going to do is it's going to add up all of the yeses that were down there. So 
in an if-then statement, you have to, there's three parts to an if-then statement. So this is now 2058 or over 80,000 in 2002. And then if I wanted to do the same thing for 2004, I could do the three parts of an if-then statement are, first of all, starting the function. Okay, so the logical test. The logical tests are either greater than, equal to, less than, or greater than, or equal to. And so if I wanted to do, if I, if I wanted to say it had to be 80 is, uh, over, 80 is bad, like it should be included, when I do 80, well, if this is greater than or equal to. So if you have both, then that's going to include any that are 80.0 as passing the logical test. So if it's greater than or equal to 80, then return 1. And if not, meaning if the value is false, 0. And you can even do uh, text rather than numbers. We could have it say, um, illegal, and then that's cool. <laughs> I think that'll work. Yeah, all right. So if I now fill that down through all of them, it found the illegal ones. But the problem with that is that I can't do a sum, right? So if I now did equal sum with this, it's not going to have. To, it's not going to know how to sum up illegal versus that's cool. So instead of it having the text for the uh, for the result of the logical test, I just put a 1 and a 0 because those numbers can be added up by the sum operation. All right. So that's an if then. Thanks for reminding me about that. Any other questions? Yes. Ah, okay. Good question. So I typed it in once, and then there's this, you see the green border that's going around the cell? There's a, a, a little box in the corner that's thicker than the rest of it. And if I double click on that green box, then it'll go all the way to the bottom. And it saves me the trouble of like, I could have clicked and drag it down, and that's another way of applying the formula. But for 40,000 of them, it's just easier just to do a double click, and then it'll go down. But let me give you one caution, is it'll only work if your formula is adjacent to the data. So let's say I was typing in my formula here, equals if this is greater than 80, then 1, or 0, is if false. I couldn't double click now because I'm not immediately adjacent to some cells. Like it wouldn't know when to stop is the problem. So if I double click, it won't go anywhere. But if I did that right here, it'll work because it's in a column that's just next to the data. So it kind of has to know how long to do that, you know, when to stop. And it'll go as long as it's adjacent to some data, it'll keep going that entire number of rows. Other questions? All right. I'm going to stick around for a while, so if you have some individual concerns that you want to check on with me, I'm happy to go over that with you. Otherwise, uh, we will meet again on Tuesday.